So I'm going out with a, a great verse from The Voice, um, and I put it on the post that we said tonight's message is going to be called The Liberating King. And in The Voice translation, that's one of the names that uh, he gives to Jesus. And I, I'm taking the last verse in the book of Acts as my text, and Acts has 28 chapters. This is verse 31 in Acts 28, which means really after the four Gospels in the book of Acts, then we just get into the letters. So we really kind of pick up the baton as Paul is passing that last verse in the book of Acts because we want to say that we're living in the 29th chapter of Acts, right? Because we're filled with Holy Spirit. That's the picture. The whole book of Acts is the birthing of the church and the amazing way that God multiplied the kingdom and, and, and spread the influence of believers who were not really special people in any kind of qualification way. They were just willing to put their life on the line and serve God and, and be faithful to him. So the way it's worded in the voice, it says, Paul proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the ultimate authority, the Lord Jesus, God's anointed, the liberating king. Can you say that? The liberating king. Do me a favor, just turn it on. The liberating king is Jesus Christ. My wife and I came out here in 1999 and started our first Bible study, and we didn't use that phrase because I don't think the voice translation was out yet, but that's who we were trying to proclaim Jesus to be from the very first day that we started the church. It was Tuesday night Bible studies at the firehouse in Bernardsville, and uh, it was the idea was that if God was in this, it was going to grow, and if he wasn't, it wouldn't, because if he's not liberating people, then we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, because that's what the gospel does. It liberates people. It takes them out of slavery to sin and brings them into the forgiveness and the relationship with Jesus Christ. So I just love this name. It's part of our mission statement as a church to be his representatives, and another word they use in here, his is emissaries. It's a great word. It's like an ambassador. We're emissaries for the king of the real kingdom, the kingdom of God that's in the earth that, that we get to participate in. And if you were with us Sunday, I was talking about pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling that Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 3. And I guess I would say the, the, the thing I'm, I'm putting out on the table is that we might have our eyes set too low, that, that mark that we're setting, that we're reaching for, might be too low. And I'm trying to get us to raise our eyes to a higher prize than just dying and going to heaven. I think that we can live with the idea that we can flourish while we're here on the earth. This is what scripture tells us. And instead of just thinking the end is dying and going to heaven, is to think of ourselves coming back with Jesus to rule and reign for eternity. He said the new Jerusalem was coming from heaven to the earth and that we would rule and reign with him as kings and priests forever. So if you're with somebody, say you're a good looking king. I can't hear my wife too loud, but she's saying it. She's cooperating. You're a good-looking king, Danny, and a good-looking priest. Because this is part of, I think, what happened in the 2,000 years since this all happened. We have kind of watered it down a bit to say, all I have to do is make the cut. I have to say a prayer and accept the Lord. He'll save me. And because you can't earn any favor with God, he'll just forgive me if I make a mistake. And as long as I live close enough... To, to the Lord, I'll still get into heaven when I die. Please hit the, hit the upgrade button on that one, okay? Because you were made to flourish here in the earth. All these gifts he gave us are to help in this battle between good and evil that we know as the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness that the enemy runs. And he even called himself that. He said, all this has been given to me, but if you'll bow down, Jesus, and worship me, I'll give it to you. And, and Jesus is like, no, no, you don't get it. There's one God, and we serve the one true God. So we don't want to believe the lies. Amen? I'm just putting up a slide that I showed Sunday because I think it's important if you could take a screenshot of this and dig down a little. I won't go through the whole thing other than at the top that there's a crown there, right? And we have to think about who is the authority in our life. And you want this word right here, the Bible, the best-selling book of all time every year, to be the final authority. Problem is, if it's just the word without the spirit, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So we're asking the Lord to give us insight and wisdom. And just like Trisha had a prophetic word tonight about somebody with a toothache, she said it might sound like it's coming out of left field, but this is what the Lord is showing me. 
that's a sign of an interactive, life-giving relationship that we have with the Lord. We would call it a prophetic lifestyle, where you're expecting to hear a personal voice from the Lord for you every day, because he's a good father. And if he loves us, he's going to tell us what to do. And as you see on this chart, it's very clearly spelled out. The darkness is on one side and the light is on the other side. And I give you verse after verse after verse about the contending for the authority that goes on in our lives. And every time you believe a lie, you're tilting to the left side of that chart. Because the, Jesus said Satan is the father of lies, right? So that's not who we represent. We represent the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. So it might sound like I'm oversimplifying this, but I'm really not. There's a war going on for the authority in your life. Who are you going to bow your knee to? And if you bow in fear and you cower in fear, that's not what God is asking us to do. He wants us to be soldiers who are willing to fight in the battle and to defeat the enemy. It says that he was manifest to destroy the works of the enemy. So if we're his emissaries, we're supposed to do the same thing. And as I came down, I put Philippians 2.10 on there. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All of us one day will bow before him. Better to do it now than to wait until then. And that exodus that we're in this season now, we've come through Passover and we're on our way to Pentecost. That's a crossing over period. You're coming out of lies and you're going to truth. You're coming out of darkness and you're going into light. You're renewing your mind with the truth of the word of God and the revelation of Holy Spirit showing you what it means and how to live this life. And you're not living with this idea that I just have to make the cut when I die so I get into heaven. That is not the plan. The plan is to flourish in all the gifts that God has for you. I was interacting with Chuck Pierce this week. Um, we were texting back and forth. And the Lord showed me something about him. And, you know, if you've been watching the Gloria Zion uh, video, uh, uh, the live streaming that they've been doing with these watches, I said to him, you do more in a week than most people do in a month. It's unbelievable how much energy that he has. And we know that even prior to this week because my wife travels all over the world with him. And I said, what the Lord showed me was, when you walk in your full anointing the way he is right now, the Lord bends time in your favor. So you actually become way more productive when you find the calling of your life. You can get more done in a short amount of time because you're in that zone of that maxima optimized place that God wants you to be. And he is impacting people all over the world. Like you would think he would want to slow down now because he's got a big ministry. And no, that's not what the calling is. We're going to continue to do what God asks us to do. And we should be getting better and better at it as the years go by. And the more the truth comes and renews your mind, the more effective you're going to be for the Lord. And there's really no limit to what God can do through you if you're willing to get your ego out of the way and your pride out of the way and let him take the reins of your life. And uh, he texted me back and said, thank you. And um, he said, well, I'm just trying to get us through this uh, crossover season until this coronavirus ends. And I said, yeah, but, you know, God gave Elijah a supernatural power to run faster than the chariots. And we speak that over you, Chuck. We just say that God is going to continue to anoint you to do great exploits for the kingdom. And we receive that from you as our covering as well. All right, so you take a screenshot of this and you go through the verses. I'll go through some of them tonight. But just remember that the idea of contending and warfare is built right in to the Bible. It's nothing to be afraid about. We don't have to say, oh, well, God is just love and it'll all just work out. That's what the devil wants you to think. There's a contending for your altar. And, and you have to decide who's going to have authority over your life. It takes a lot of faith to trust in God because he asks you to do things that you don't think you can do. But if you remember... When you were riding your bike as a young child and you were learning how to ride that bike, you probably didn't ride it good the first time, right? What happened? You fell. <laughs> I sure did. I still remember it very vividly. I ran into the bushes because I didn't know how to use the brakes and I got stopped by the bushes. My father was not mad at me because I didn't do it right the first time. He picked me up and got me back on the bike and, and he kept on teaching me and that's what the Lord does for us. We don't get spanked if we make a mistake. He encourages us and shows us, and he wants us to have that desire to keep on learning and keep on growing. And we're going to see that. that we, well, I actually talked about it Sunday, that when every one of us finds the spot that he has, we all help each other grow and mature, and we become different members of his body. Awesome teaching, which I'll do another day. 
But today, what I said to Chuck at the end of my text was, you have set a new plumb line for us, right? We can look at you and see how productive you are and how much energy you have and how you've pulled all these different people together from all over the world and all these ministries that are following you. You set a new plumb line. You, you, you raise a bar for us that lets us know what God can accomplish through somebody. Because in the natural, it doesn't look like he should still have so much energy for how much he does. It's supernatural. Praise God. God loves us all. Ask for more. Find that place where you're walking in your full anointing. So Philippians 3, I put the new plumb line up at the top there. Verse 18 says, Paul starts by saying, we have many enemies, okay? And, and that's not something to, to be afraid about because we're, we're in a battle. There's a contending going on. If the enemy can get you to believe lies, it takes you away from the will of God because the will of God is truth. So we have many people who are enemies, people who reject the cross that we just sang about. They don't want to think about having a sacrifice. They want to be able to say, it's my party, and I'll do whatever I want to do, right? It's my body. I'll do whatever I want to do. You can't tell me what to do. Psalm 2 says the heathen rage against God, saying, let's break his chains off our lives. They don't like the restrictions that a good father will give us. There's a rebellious attitude in the world. That's what sin does to us. But the wages of that lifestyle is death. But the gift that God gives us is eternal life through Christ. Whew. So these are people, he says, who are ruled by their bellies. And you could just translate that to say they can't control their appetites. They can't say no. They can't stop in their excess. And God's saying, no, if you live with me, if you do it my way and you come under my covering, I'm going to give you boundary lines. And it's going to cause you to flourish and live your life in a way that produces much fruit for the kingdom. They're ruled by their bellies and their glory comes by shame. He's saying there that the, the more shameful things they do, that's almost like a status symbol of who can outdo the other person in doing more shameful acts. It's turned upside down from virtue and what God says is, should be our priorities. Their minds are fixed on things of this world and they are doomed. And Paul's not saying that in a condemning way because he went about as hard as he could try to get people converted to understand the Lord. And he actually had more success with unbelievers and very sinful people than the religious people. You're gonna, we're going to see that near the end of what I talk about tonight is they gave him so much opposition. He said, you know, you Jewish people who know the law, you're so stubborn and hard-hearted that God is opening up the gates of the kingdom to all people. The Gentiles are coming in ahead of you because your religion has locked you down. So we got to watch both sides of that. We don't want to live this, um, you know, this careless lifestyle where sin is a mark of some kind of, you know, a high mark. The more shameful things I could do, the more status I get in that group. No, that's how I used to live. That's a dying way to go. But we also don't want to be so stuck in religious and so, like, dead religion, right? That's why I said that. The Bible says the letter of the law by itself without the spirit will kill people. So we have to find that place that Jesus showed us that he could love the sinner but still hate the sin that they were doing. We can live in this place with the oil of the Holy Spirit showing us how to apply the word of God. All right, verse 20 and 21, this is, this is key. It says, we are citizens of heaven. All right, that doesn't mean we died. All right, it means right now here in the earth, we are citizens of heaven. That's a good thing to say. Danny, did you get your green card? Yes. When you got saved, you got your green card, and you are now a citizen of heaven. And, and we are too. Even though we didn't die and have to leave and go into heaven, because we're in, in the family of God and he's our father, we got a new passport. We got stamped as citizens of heaven, even though we're here. And he calls it exiles on the earth, waiting eagerly for a liberator, because Jesus is the liberating king. He sets us free, and then we go and help other people get free. And I'll just say another thing about Chuck Pierce, too, because one of the things I didn't recognize was the idea of impartation. So there's one thing to learn this at a head knowledge level and to understand Scripture. It's important to do that. It's another thing that when you're walking in that anointing, that like he does at least in the prophetic anointing, he doesn't just teach you about the prophetic. When you're with him and you're under that covering, you receive the gift and you become more prophetic. That's a beautiful thing, and I believe it works in all the, the gifts. Uh, the, uh, if it's an apostolic calling or an evangelistic calling, when you're walking in the fullness of the calling that you have, the people that are with you pick up that. They gain an extra strength in that area. 
And that's what Paul is saying. Our Lord Jesus, the anointed, has come to transform, um, yeah, come and transform these humble earthly bodies of ours into the form of his glorious body. Just think about that for a minute. Because, again, the picture of dying and going to heaven and just living up on a cloud like Casper the Friendly Ghost is how a lot of people think of this. That's not what this says. This is a New Testament, a book of Philippians. Paul is saying he's going to come here and he's going to transform these earthly bodies into the form of his glorious body. That's the resurrected body. And I would say to you, think back to Adam and Eve in the garden before they fell into sin. What was their body like? They were made in God's image, and they had not sinned, and they had open communication with him. So I have a feeling what Jesus looked like after the resurrection is what Adam and Eve looked like before the fall. And that's the thing that we should set the mark. That's the prize. That we're, this body that's decaying and deteriorating with every passing year is going to be replaced by the resurrected body that Jesus had. That's going to happen for each one of us. Not floating on a cloud. <laughs> I had, I had to thank God from the front row. <laughs> I get that. The glorious body by the same power that brings all things under his control. So you can look at your body, and, and you know it, it may be deteriorating on the outside, the Bible says, but on the inside, we're, we're, we're getting greater glory, right? So I'm not quoting it exactly right, but the idea is that this thing is going to pass away, but our spirit's going to live forever. And when God... When Jesus comes back for the final arrival back on the earth, we get resurrected bodies. And that should excite you. All right, now I'm going to go to Romans chapter 8. And again, this is just a little bit of a setup for the end of the book of Acts because this is Paul who wrote this. And, and we're, we're going to read about Paul right at the end of the book of Acts. And some good commentary that I found that I hope help pulls all this together of what the mark is that we should be setting. The, the, we're pressing towards something. What's the something that we're pressing towards? One author said, is it just the gospel of sin management? I, I, I end the day and I say, oh, good. I didn't commit adultery today. God must really love me. That's setting the bar too low. It's not just managing your sin. It's did I fulfill the calling that God placed in my life? For me, Peter Roselli versus Danny Hall, he has a different calling. He's a teacher. He's got an amazing access to students that I wouldn't have. I'm on Wall Street. I have access to people he would never see. I don't want to have to go be him. He doesn't want to be me. We're in our place where God told us to go, and he's going to make us effective in that place. We don't have to be jealous over other people's gifts. So here in Romans chapter 8, we're going to see a little bit more about this idea of what's coming and how God is going to not just liberate us and give us new bodies, but the whole earth is going to be liberated. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, death came on the planet. There was no death on the planet. So you might know that verse. It says, all creation is longing. What are they longing for? What are the trees and nature longing for? It might sound a little odd to you, but that's what we're going to read right here. So first it says in Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him, God, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's now while we're alive, but also that resurrected body that we're going to get. Verse 12 says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, but not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's the people he was talking about in Philippians who said, their glory is in their shame. And I'm not trying to condemn anybody because I've already told you that was my lifestyle. It was very decadent. Before I knew the Lord, that was what the world told me I should do. And I was living up to the wrong image, not God's image for me. And it was leading me to death. So thank God he saved me. And then I have to say, like we sang, it's no longer I. That person is gone now. It's Christ who lives in me. And I surrender and I submit. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And use me however you can use me. Help me flourish so that your kingdom can advance. I want to be an emissary for the kingdom of God in the earth. All right, so if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. I've got three of them right in the front row here. Three daughters of God and three sons and, and one more daughter in the back so the ladies win tonight. Praise God. Praise God. We are made in his image, men and women made in his image. 
And we are going to live because we're walking by the Spirit. And then he goes on and makes it real personal. For you didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. We sang it, right? No longer slaves to fear. I'm a child of God. That comes right out of this verse. You didn't receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we can cry out, Abba, Father. That's a very intimate name. That's Daddy in the Greek. Abba, Father, not an angry God waiting to punish you and keeping score of all the things you've done wrong. That's not the character of God. He doesn't want you to do those wrong things because he loves you just like you love your children. But it's Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You really need to grab hold of that truth. You are a child of God. No longer a slave to fear. No longer finding glory in my shameful things that I used to do. Nope, I'm adopted into a new family. He gave me an amazing love letter in this book here that shows me what the rules of engagement are and how much contending goes on for my life. Because my life can make a difference for the kingdom, and yours can too. But not if you're bound up in all the lies that the enemy is trying to get you to believe. All right? So, And then it says, if we're his children, then we're also heirs. So we're written into the will. <laughs> heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus, who's our brother. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, what does he mean by that? What's the suffering with him? Well, if you're going to live a life of righteousness in the world, the world's going to make fun of you. And they're going to try to pull you down. And they're going to say, well, you're just a hypocrite. You're, you're saying one thing, but you don't really believe it. You just think you're better than I am. And there's all kinds of ways that th those attacks can come. But here's the deal. If you're, if you're a man and woman after God's own heart, people are going to be drawn to you, and, and you're going to find favor. Because they, at, at, at the core of their being, if they don't know the Lord, there's confusion, and there's, there's thoughts that are tangled up, and there's questions that they've been running away from. And, and you're walking into their life, and you're giving them a different model. You're showing them something different. And that's what Paul is going to do here in the book of Acts. We're going to just cover a couple of things that he did. But just by being with unsaved people, he was a prisoner on his way to Rome. He found so much favor that the, the officer in charge of the Roman army, instead of killing all the prisoners, because he didn't want Paul to die, he changed the whole destiny of everybody on that ship. And, and it wasn't because Paul got him converted. It was just because this, this centurion, this officer in the Roman army, just saw favor on him. Speak it over yourself. I have favor with God and with man because I'm trying to live as best as I can to what he asked me to do. And, and each one of us, you know, we're not competing against each other. We all have been given a gift, and now it's a matter of how hard am I willing to try to fulfill the calling that he placed on my life. You're not earning salvation by works, but what you are doing is saying, I want to be the best soldier in the army I can be. So I'm going to discipline myself. Paul said, if you're going to run the race, run to win it. Don't just run to finish. Try to win. Different race for each of us. Next verse, Romans 8, 18. Still saying that new plumb line. And I love the surety. Look at how it says it. Now, I'm sure of this. The sufferings that we endure now are not even worth comparing to the glory that is coming and will be revealed in us. All right? Not for us, in us. He's talking about the new resurrected body that you're going to have at the final return of Christ. And it's also talking about the glory revealed in us while we're here. And he's going to use this, like, two-stage language. He's going to talk about a down payment, that when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, God is giving you a taste of what heaven is like in full. He's giving you the taste of Holy Spirit here now. When we're with God forever, then we're not going to have any sin to contend with anymore. But right now, there's this dual contending that's going on. And as Holy Spirit fills you and operates in your life, you're getting a taste of the glory to come, a down payment. I'll show you that language here. And again, remember, a light and momentary affliction. He calls it in a different translation. The things that we're going through now, it's just a light and momentary affliction compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Verse 19, that's what I said earlier. All creation is waiting and yearning for the time when the children of God will be revealed. You see, all of creation has collapsed into emptiness. Now, that's pretty strong language, isn't it? 
But he's talking about the fall in the garden in, in the book of Genesis. It collapsed because sin didn't just come to man and woman. Sin was brought into the earth. And there was a curse put on the ground because of their disobedience. They were supposed to rule the earth and, and steward the, the, what God gave them, the gifts that God gave them. And that included the garden and the earth. Now it says it collapsed, not by its own choosing. All right? So what does that mean? That, that nature didn't choose to sin, but nature was under the rulership of Adam and Eve by God's decree. So when they sinned, nature was punished too. And it says it wasn't by its own choosing, by nature's choosing, but by God's, because God put the Adam and Eve in charge, and he gave them a choice, and they sinned. So that hurt nature. So still, he placed within it a deep, abiding hope that creation would one day be liberated. There it is again, that word liberated, because he's the liberating king. That nature would be liberated from its slavery to corruption or death, because there's death and decay in nature too. It's not God's plan. No death in God's plan. And uh, experience the glorious freedom of the children of God. So when, when sinless people are ruling and reigning over the earth, there's going to be no death. And Adam and Eve had that option, but they chose the wrong option. And then it says in verse 22, For we know that all creation groans in unison with birthing pains up until now. And there's more. It's not just creation because all of us are groaning together too. We want to be taken out of this decaying body and put on a body that has no death in it and will never decay. Though we already have tasted the first fruits of the Spirit. That's what I was saying earlier, right? When you accepted the Lord, you had to have Holy Spirit making that decision with you because it says no one can call Jesus Lord unless the Spirit puts those words in your mouth. So God pours out his spirit on all flesh, and there's a communion that goes on. And you make a decision and say, yes, I want to go to the true father. I want to come out from the fatherhood of Satan and sin and that shameful life that I was living, and I want to come under the real father. I want to be able to cry, Abba, Father, to God. And will I live a perfect life after that? No, but you'll be pursuing the perfect life that God has for us. It takes time. You will mature. When you start, you'll make mistakes. We're like babies that are drinking milk. But God says, no, I want you to get off the milk and get onto the solid food of mature people. And when you get plugged into a body of believers that are alive in the Lord, that are pursuing him together, then we hold each other accountable and we help each other grow. All right. So that's what it says. We have already tasted the first fruits of the spirit and we are longing for the total redemption of our bodies that comes when our adoption as children of God is complete. For as we've been saved in this hope and for this future, okay, for what future? Heaven when we die? No. Ruling and reigning on earth with the new Jerusalem here. <laughs> not that heaven's a bad place, but that's not the final stop. All right? If you were taking a flight, we, my wife and I did. We, we took a flight to uh, Mozambique, Africa. We had to make a stop on the way. We were on the journey, but we hadn't reached our final destination. When we made the stop, it was just for refueling. And then we got to our final destination where we're going. Well, the final destination is back here with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning and us ruling and reigning with him. That sounds really exciting to me. That's what my hope is. That's the mark that I'm pressing for. Everything that I do in this life, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Remember that, amen? If we wait expectantly for things that we've never seen, then we hope with true perseverance and eager anticipation. And that's what I'm saying. Don't live a dull, boring life as a Christian. Don't live with the gospel of sin management. Oh, well, there's really nothing I can do. I'm saved by grace, and, and it's not of work, so anything I try to do is just going to be a works mentality. We're not saying that you're going to earn your salvation by works. We're saying be a disciplined soldier. If you're going to be in the Army, be a Navy SEAL. Don't be Barney Fife. <laughs> We're old enough to remember that one, Carolina. <laughs> and then in Romans 8, 6, it says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is having a war, is at enmity, is having a war against God. That mind that used to glory in the shame that we are involved in that carnal mind is at war with God because it does not want to be subject to the law of God. 
Psalm 2, why do the heathen rage? That's it right there. Does not want to be subject to the law, nor can it be. Because without Holy Spirit opening that door for us, we're just going to rage against God. You have to invite him in. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of covenant faithfulness. That's what we talked about. Because Jesus was faithful to the covenant. He said in the garden, not my will, Father, but yours be done. Nevertheless, if this cup can't pass from me, I will do what you said you told me to do. I'm going to complete the mission that you gave me. And because of that covenant faithfulness of Jesus, you and I have the right to come in as co-joint heirs with Jesus. Wow, adopted into his family. All right, so I'm going to end with that last chapter of Acts that I told you about, just a couple of different verses from there. But I really like this commentary because it, it kind of reflects on what I was saying earlier, that we are emissaries for the kingdom of God now while we're here. And you only get one chance, right? This life is all we get. So we want to make the most of the life that he gives us while we're here. We want to really pursue hard after God. That's one of the Psalms. My soul follows hard after you. Early in the morning, I will seek you. I'm going to really ask you, Lord, I want to know the perfect will of God for my life. And that takes some time and that takes some effort. So this is from the voice commentary uh, in the book of Acts. It says, Luke's story in Acts is a narration about, quote, unquote, the way. That's what the church was called in the early days, the way. As it moved from Jerusalem, which was at the edge of the Roman Empire, all the way to Rome. And in this last chapter of Acts that we'll look at, Paul is actually in Rome, and he's going to stand before Caesar. It says, therefore, Luke's story finishes once the message of Jesus has gone all the way from Jerusalem to the capital of the world at the time, which was Rome. As it moves geographically, the way, the church, the early church, crosses all kinds of boundaries, cultural, linguistic, linguistic and religious boundaries. I love this part. At every point, Luke assures that the Spirit is there, demonstrating God's blessing on and approval of the emissaries. That's us. So every step of the way, Holy Spirit is with us, and he's demonstrating through what we do. When we step out in faith and we say, yes, I'm going to pray for that sick person. Oh, isn't that risky? What if they don't get better? Well, what if they do get better? I'm believing that they will. And I'm not going to stop praying just because somebody I prayed for once didn't get healed. No, I'm stepping out in faith. I'm going to be an emissary for the kingdom. So Luke is assuring us that the Spirit is there demonstrating God's blessing on and approval of the emissaries. That's us who walk in the footsteps of Jesus and in fulfillment of prophecies. Clearly, what happened in those early decades was driven by the spirit wind of heaven. And God's purposes are realized through the faithful obedience of disciples. Can you raise your hand? I will be a faithful, obedient disciple. I'm waiting for my wife. She hasn't raised it yet. Okay, I love, I'm just checking. You know, I, I got one of these little ones. On my. Faithful obedience. <laughs> She's going to come up here and grab the mic out of my hand. <laughs> and then he gives us examples. Peter, Stephen, Philip, and Paul. These were not perfect people but they were faithful and they were obedient. And then it says Luke's account has ended, but the story about the acts of God through the church, come on, continues into our day today. Do you believe that? Amen. Well, if you do, then you need to seek what that calling is for your life. How are you going to be an emissary? How is God going to use you and be fruitful through you? We are the characters in the current volume of salvation history. You get one chance. This life is it. Make the most of your chance. It's your turn right now. What are you doing with it? Don't live in regret later to say, I, I miss my day of visitation. No, we want to know the day of visitation and walk in it. And then it says right at the end of his commentary, through our faithful obedience, also empowered by the spirit wind of heaven, our stories are part of the anthology of God's new creation. Sets the bar pretty high, doesn't it? That we're no different than the apostles in the book of Acts, and we really are living in Acts chapter 29. Even though it ended, 
we have been passed the baton, and it's your turn now. What are you going to do with it when it gets handed to you? So these are the few verses I'll cover. Acts 28, 2. <laughs> again, it says, the natives on this island of Malta, again, it's kind of jumping in the middle of the story, but Paul was taken as a prisoner, and he's on a ship, and they just went through in chapter 27 this really terrible storm, and, and that's what I said. This, this Roman centurion said, I'm gonna, I don't want to kill Paul, so I'm going to let these people live, and they make it because Paul had a prophetic word, and he said, don't worry. We're not going to lose any life. The ship's going to be destroyed, but every one of us is going to make it, and they do. So this is when they land on the beach in this island called Malta. It said the natives, but when you look up the literary word, it says barbarians, okay? I don't know what you think of when you hear that word barbarian, but I got a pretty, pretty vivid picture in my mind that they're kind of cranky people, and you don't want to get on the wrong side of them, like maybe like hell's angels, right? The barbarians. That's who showed us unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire and made us all welcome. Now, who's writing this is Luke, and he's with Paul on the journey. And he's a very good scribe. He wrote all the Gospel of Luke and a whole book of Acts, and it's just brilliant the way he wrote all this down. And he's saying, we, they made us a fire, and they made us all welcome because of the rain and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a snake or a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from Paul's hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer who, though he escaped the storm on the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. Right? Now just think of this. This is the way the barbarian uh, that I used to be would think too. Right? That, oh well, what goes around comes around. Like I was, I was under all the wrong rules in my brain. And, and you would see something bad happen to somebody and say, well, what goes around comes around. I had no idea about the blessing of God. I had no idea about being obedient to him and the blessings that come with obedience. So these barbarians are just thinking, oh, well, the guy survived the, the storm, but his luck caught up with him. Right? But as Christians, we don't believe in luck. We believe in blessing oh, and obedience to God, and that brings favor. And and. They're expecting him to die because I'm sure they've seen this happen to other people. Verse 5 says, Paul shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. <laughs> Notice a small g there because that's how barbarians are. And look, I'm not trying to put anybody down, but... When your mind is not locked in on the things of the Lord, you're a barbarian in some way. Maybe not as obvious as these people were, but your, your formulas of how you think the world works are off. They're crooked. So now all of a sudden they go from thinking that he's been cursed by God to thinking he is a God because he didn't die. And in that region, there was an estate of a leading citizen of that island, a man named Publius, who re received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And again, I'll just go back to my trip to Mozambique with my wife because Heidi Baker has an amazing work that she's doing over there. But it's in a, a relatively poor part of the island of Mozambique. But there was a city nearby. And I don't remember exactly how it worked out, but we went into the city and spoke to one of the wealthy people who lived there who had, where Heidi Baker had found favor with him, even though he wasn't a Christian yet. He was actually a Muslim, and we got to sit in his house and talk to him about trying to help the, the ministry that she had there, and it was incredible. It's a very similar picture here that in the midst of, of, of really deep poverty, like third world country poverty, this man was a very strong success because he had a beautiful house. It was just like any house that you would see here in America, and it was such a stark contrast. And here he was saying, I want to help this lady because I know what she's doing is right and it's really good. I don't fully understand everything. I don't believe everything she believes. I would say yet. <laughs> but God was using her to be a light in the midst of that darkness. So now Paul is in that same situation. He comes out of this storm. He lands on the island. You know, the people there are going, wow, you were lucky. You didn't die out in that storm. You were lucky. And Paul's saying, no, it wasn't luck. Uh, God told me, I'm getting, I'm getting to Rome. 
I'm getting there. And while I'm on the way, I'm going to be an emissary for God, and I'm going to let his light shine, and I'm not going to complain about the things that are, I'm not comfortable about. So now he gets into this man's house, and he's being treated for three days. And it says that it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of fever and dysentery. So what did Paul do? Say, well, too bad for him. No. What an emissary does is what Jesus would have done, right? He went in and prayed. Paul went to him and prayed, laid hands on him, and healed him. That's what it says. It doesn't say he prayed that the Lord would heal him. Paul healed him. You got an argument with that? Take it up with God. I'm just reading the Bible. Paul went in and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. Amen. It's an emissary. That's what an emissary does. Doesn't worry about whether it's convenient or it looks good or it's the right place. It wasn't what I was expecting. God, I hate it when the ship crashes. No. He made the most of the situation he was in. And that's what we're supposed to do. And sometimes in the most unlikely ways, God will use you if you're open to the opportunities that are there. Now, when this man, you know, told him about his father-in-law, that was what we call a sliding door. The Lord opened up a door of opportunity. Paul had an option to say, nah, I'm good. I'm going to go back to the, to the camp. No, he said, oh, really? Your father-in-law's sick? Can I pray for him? Why don't we do the same thing? We should. What's the worst thing that can happen? You don't see an immediate response, but you're stepping out in faith as an emissary and ambassador for the kingdom. It's not about whether it's going to happen in front of your eyes or not. It's whether you will be obedient to do it or not. So, wow, the whole island, everybody who had a disease came and everybody on the island was healed. That's a miracle. All through this man who almost died at sea and got bit by a snake. No, emissary of God. They honored us in many ways. Such things were necessary. And it says, I, I skipped ahead now right to near the end. There was a couple of more stops. They landed actually right near Naples. If you look at the town, it's called Puteoli in the Bible. But that's a section of modern Naples, which is where my family right, came from right near there. And um, so all these crazy Romans are my relatives, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I'm trying to redeem the bloodline here. <laughs> it says from t in verse 23, again, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of the gap filler, is that they get from this place called Pudioli, which is on the island, uh, on the isthmus, isthmus of Italy. So they land on the mainland of Italy, and now they have to go about 50 miles uh, after they get to a place called the Three Taverns. It's about 50 miles more to get to Rome. So now he gets to Rome, and they give him a house, and they even give him favor there. Even though he's a prisoner, they let him have a room of his own with one guard, and anybody can come and visit him. So the first people he calls are the Jewish leaders in Rome. Okay, now you would think with a story like Paul has that they would be really happy to see him, right? And they hadn't heard much about him. And again, you could read the 28th chapter of Acts to get more detail on this. But here he is, a pillar of the early church, somebody who's going to end up writing a good chunk of the New Testament. In fact, Luke and Paul together make up a very big chunk of the New Testament. They, they wrote, the two of them wrote more than anyone else of the whole New Testament. And they were traveling together here. Sad what happens. It says, from morning until evening, Paul explained the message to them, the good news of the gospel. The God that you've been waiting for, Jewish leaders, has come. His name is Jesus. He, he isn't what you look, what you thought he was going to look like. He doesn't look like King David coming in with an army and killing the Romans. He's got a better revolution. It's a revolution of the heart. It's salvation. It's going to spread across the whole earth. I'm telling you, it's really him. He resurrected from the dead. And I know that's true. And they gave him a hard time. So what does it say? Morning till evening, he explained the message to them, giving his account of the kingdom of God, trying to convince them that Jesus, from the law of Moses and the prophet's writings, some were convinced, but others refused to believe. What a shame. Right? That's the part I was trying to warn you about earlier, that just like the decadent lifestyle can cause you to go way off the rail, so can an overly religious lifestyle. That locking in of thinking, I already know what it says, and I know what it means. Anybody who disagrees with me is wrong. And that's not having a heart that's pliable and open that the Lord might show you something new. 
Man lives by the preceding word, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You really need that prophetic lifestyle to be open that the Lord might show you a new revelation. I'm asking him for that on a regular basis. So then he rebukes them. Paul says, adding, as they left in disagreement, right? So the Jews left. They kind of threw their, their hands up in the air and said, we're rejecting this message. And then Paul says, verse 25, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah. Go to this people and say, you certainly do hear, but you will never understand. You certainly do see, but you will never have insight. Make their hearts hard and their ears deaf and their eyes blind. Otherwise, they would look and see and listen and hear and understand and repent and be healed. So that's a real warning for us, okay? Just, just, it's, just be open to what the Lord wants to show you. It's like any good father. You get excited when your children want to learn something. You get excited when you see them flourishing in the thing that you saw in them and you called it out and you helped them grow into that thing. That's what God is looking at us like a good father. If you didn't have a good father or a good relationship there, you need to just kind of flush the image of the earthly model and say, I believe that God can be that perfect father in my life. And he has a good plan for me. Jeremiah 29, 11, plans to prosper and not to perish, plans for you to succeed. So then it says the local Jewish leaders left Paul to discuss all that he had told them and with great confidence, this is that last verse that I quoted earlier, with great confidence and with no hindrance, he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the ultimate authority, the Lord Jesus, God's anointed, the liberating king. Mm -hmm. So as we leave Egypt, not really, this building was not Egypt, but we're, this is our last service in this building. We came out here in 1999 talking about Jesus as the liberating king, hopefully demonstrating that as his emissaries. We don't ever want to stop doing that. We want to keep seeing people get free. And there's a few left in New Jersey that need to get free. That's the latest news I heard. <laughs> Not that we've arrived, that's for sure. But we're here to try to live out the mission that God gave us, which is to preach Jesus as the liberating king. So that's what I wrote at the bottom there, Acts 29 with a question mark. What do you think? Are you just sitting home and saying, please, Jesus, come back. Please get me out of here. It's such a mess. I can't take it here. That's not a Navy SEAL, okay? We're not afraid of the battle. We're saying, Lord, no, I don't like what's going on out there. I've been talking to people all week that have lost loved ones and that are in a tough spot. You know, that's not easy to try to counsel people that can't have a funeral or being told that it's going to be two weeks before their mother or father's body can be processed. And, you know, this is so far out of whack and so much of a lack of closure. It's, it's a chaotic time that we're living in. But we don't serve a chaotic God. He's the Prince of Peace. So pull that peace down from heaven right now and, and just invite him into your heart. We've been saying it every time we have a service here. We're, we're seeing the number of views on, on you, uh, Facebook have been over 1,000 when, when, when we look at it, like 1,500 people. Maybe some of you that are watching don't know the Lord, and, and you're just a friend of you, a friend of yours asks you to watch. You know, what would be the good news that your friend would say is that you don't have to live this life alone. You don't have to live under darkness. You can live in the light. Does it mean to be perfect? No. Christians make mistakes too, of course. But what we just try to live life with a different mission. We want to represent the king. He's a perfect king. And he, and he comes to imperfect people. And, and we just gather together as the church and we try to help each other grow in our walk with the Lord. We try to hold each other accountable to live honorable lives before the Lord. And we celebrate when we see the gift surfacing in people. And we want to see that happen for you. Even if we never meet in person, we have a YouTube channel. I mean, I get, I get comments from people all over the world, and I'm not going to meet them in person, but I'm glad that something that we did is blessing them and helping them grow stronger in their walk. So many times they'll say, this was for me. If nobody else saw this video today, I know the Lord put this up there because I needed to hear this today. And if that's you, all we're going to do, we have to end because we're getting near the end here of our time. But we just want to say a prayer that will help you know how to invite God into your life. It's really not hard. 
but it's also not free. There was a high price that was paid on that cross. So we don't do this with a flip attitude. You know, we want to recognize that, that sin is a really serious condition. It's, it's, it's a terminal illness. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through his son, Jesus. So we don't trample on that gift. We recognize the incredible price he paid so that faithfulness to the covenant with his father gave us access to come into the kingdom. So let's just say a prayer out loud together. You all want to help me out of here in the front? You want to stand? And we'll just say this prayer out loud together. And we're going to just invite the Lord to come into our lives. We're going to repent for the ungodly lifestyle that we live, have lived. And we're going to ask him to come in and fill us with his power and fill us with the truth of his word to cancel every lie that we've been believing. Lord, I just lift up every person who's watching right now and anybody who doesn't know you that's about to say this prayer. I pray you'd make yourself so real to them that you would just capture their heart and let them recognize the truth that's in your word. So let's say this together, okay? Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I heard something tonight that gives me hope that we'll get out of this desperate situation. I recognize I'm a sinner and that I can't save myself. I've been running away from you, afraid that you wanted to punish me. But I heard tonight that I don't have to be afraid of you because you love me and your son was willing to come here and die in my place. Take the punishment that I deserve on his back so that I would have access into your presence. I repent of my sin. I turn from that sinful life. And I invite you to come in and take the reins of my life. I'm giving you the controls and ask you to steer me in your direction. I heard about Holy Spirit and I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit to empower me to serve you for the rest of my life. Thank you, Lord, that you are my Lord and Savior today. I accept you as my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's a good prayer. If you invited him to come in, he's going to make himself real to you. I promise you that. We will send you a Bible. You can just contact us. Reach out to us through the web. It's kingofkingswc.com. You can get info right there, right on our website. We'll get out any information we can. We'll meet you and, and counsel with you any way we can to bring you along to be emissaries for the kingdom of God. Looks, did you want to say something? Yeah, my wife is just going to say something as we close here. So as uh, my husband was talking about the viper that uh, bit Paul, you know, I feel like this virus has been a viper and it's trying to attach itself to us and, and release its toxins, its poisons on the body of chronic people. So I just felt like as a prophetic act, just, just shake yourself and just say the virus of this, I mean, the, the, the yeah, well, the, the viper bite, the virus is not going to, you know, overtake me. Just say that the virus of the media the confusion that the media is releasing is not going to attach itself to me. The, the virus of fear is not going to attach itself to me. Because we have the power of the blood of Jesus. And, you know, we need to release that. We need to make those decrees and understand that, you know, God has provided a way out for us and for his people. And we are the emissaries to minister that. But I just, I just was seeing Jesus sucking the toxins of this virus out of us. And so, and whatever this thing is trying to attach itself, you know, for some who, who hasn't had it, but we know family members who have and, you know, really been afflicted by it. You know, let's just pray that the toxins of fear and anxiety and worry, fear about our finances being removed. We're shaking it off. We're coming out of agreement with that cloak that the enemies try to place on us of, of this, this virus. And we say you are defeated by the power of the blood of Jesus in Jesus' name.